Hello and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast. This podcast is hosted by the Chair of Circular Economy and Urban Metabolism held by Aristide Tenasiadis and Stefan Kamperman at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. In this podcast, we talk with researchers, policymakers and different practitioners to unravel the complex aspects of what makes urban metabolism and economies more circular. Bonjour et bienvenue au podcast Circular Métabolisme. Ce podcast est produit par la chaire en économie circulaire et métabolisme urbain de l'Université Libre de Bruxelles, qui est tenue par Aristide Athanasiadis et Stéphane Kempelman. Dans ce podcast, nous discutons avec des chercheurs, des administrations et des praticiens pour éclaircir les différents aspects qui rendent l'économie et le métabolisme de nos villes plus circulaires. On this episode of the Circular Metabolism podcast, we talk with Adrian Hill, the project coordinator of Cities of Making. This project is funded by the joint programming initiative Urban Europe and explore what is the role of industries in cities and more specifically in Brussels, Rotterdam and London. With the advent of great technological innovations ranging from automation, 3D printing, Internet of Things, etc., etc., we discuss about what 21st century cities should be making. We also elaborate on what type of industries should come back in cities, where could they be located, as well as who is likely to be employed in these new type of manufacturing activities. Finally, we explore the link between urban manufacturing and circular economy and how a productive city could tackle both social and environmental challenges. Enjoy this episode and don't forget to visit our website circularmetabolism.com to find all of our activities and productions. So, hi Adrian. <laughs> hi Aristide. We'll start all over again, but uh, welcome to this third episode of the podcast of the <laughs> Chair of Circular Economy and Urban Metabolism. We've been talking uh, with uh, the, my co-chair uh, Stefan about what is circular economy in cities, uh, what does urban metabolism uh, help us to do within this whole pro problematic and uh, you know, challenging question of circular economy in cities. Uh, we've talked about uh, briefly about, you know, the territorial aspect of circular economy and therefore, you know, who is making a circular economy? Where do we make a circular economy in cities? And you've been working on a project called Cities of Making, which I think addresses very well, uh, or at least a big chunk of this question. Uh, so I'm very glad that you're here and that you, with your many hats of, uh, of designer, landscape architect, thinker, uh, doer, uh, uh, contact, uh, content uh, manager and all that, uh, you address this question. Um, and before you explain, I think, wh what is Cities of Making and uh, how can it help to this circular economy question, um, I'll, I'd also like to, to ask you, um, you know, how do you arrive to, to a project like this? What, what's the, the context behind wanting to do a study like this? What's the, the rationale behind it? Well, cities are making um, is l focused around the question of what 21st uh, century European cities should be making. And we arrived at that, at that question based on, based on a few uh, uh, issues and trends that we've seen. We have, on the one hand, we have the, the whole question of reshoring and reindustrialization, which has raised from um, companies, organizations, regions, uh, the European Commission that have said, we shouldn't be letting our industry um, be pushed offshore. In fact, we should be bringing it back because there's a lot of value in the process. Um, You've got uh, the question of um, new technology, uh, which um, can be using um, materials uh, more effectively, which is much smaller. Um, it's quieter. It doesn't necessarily pollute. Mm. It can it can be put into um, offices, homes, shops, mm. uh, and. So the, the technology has, has changed dramatically in the last, uh, I would say, 30 years, uh, on the one hand. 
Um, on the other hand, there's also the, 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 the constant um, uh, threat to um, industrial land from cities um, because of the densification of, of cities, the repopulating of cities um, that has essentially focused on industrial uh, land to, to build housing, to build parks, to build uh, uh, shops and schools. And so businesses that um, are a little bit dirty, uh, noisy, um, that are not necessarily um, in line with our 21st century uh, concepts of urbanity yeah. are under threat because um, they, their value is not seen. Um, mm. So yeah, there's a range of different dynamics which have uh, um, uh, uh, which are coming about, which have um, uh, inspired this question about what cities should be making. That the project itself um, was uh, was developed with three case study cities, and those three case studies uh, being Brussels, and London, and Rotterdam. Why have we chosen those cities? It's because uh, they they have changed dramatically over the last um, 60 years. Mm. All of these cities have been based on one type of uh, uh, industry or another. Um, and so now we're seeing a dramatic change and particularly a lot of the, the land connected to industry which is still uh, under threat. And the, the cities themselves are asking themselves, why do we need to keep this and what value does this have for, for, for these cities? So we're hoping to, to get closer to, um, to answering that riddle. And, and then, so each of these cities, I guess, were industrial at a certain point and now they, we're at this tipping point mm. of either we exterminate industry from our territory and give it to residential areas yes. or there is something else and we don't know what this something else is. Exactly. Um, but then let's think about it. Um, and so you mentioned these technologies. I can imagine these technologies are like <coughs> CNC and then additive or, you know, <coughs> printing or um, how you call them, the, the 3D uh, printing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and wow. these could upscale to bigger technological advancements like building houses or uh, yes. uh, or building other materials in, in 3D and stuff like that but uh, is that the sole industry that cities need or what the industry will be or because there is one thing about what's the most efficient for our land and the the less noisy and the less environmentally impactful and there is another thing what does reindustrializing cities mean and what do cities need as a, as an industrial pattern you know i mean an industrial pattern could be uh, whatever we can think of it mm. ranges so much so are they specific industries that cities need or are they cities uh, cer certain um, manufacturing activities that cities are more likely to host. Mm. Have you thought of that? Or yeah, yeah absolutely. There's a there's a there's a there's a wide spectrum of mm. ki uh, of making uh, and conditions for making which um, which we need to think about. Um, you have the question of uh, manufacturing um, activities that need the city. Mm. So the manufacturing activities which um, need to be close to 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 clients, uh, or to a marketplace, or to um, a source of materials, mm -hmm. or to a university because they're very high tech, or to um, or to employees. So that's what mm. what manufacturing or industry needs from the city. Yeah. Cities, on the other hand, also need industry and manufacturing. Why? Because they deal with waste. Yeah. Uh, they provide the, the 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 material for building buildings and infrastructure. Um, they provide employment uh, and uh, a range of other things which which cities very much depend on to um, to adapt uh, and to grow. So it comes from, of course, both directions. In terms of places uh, and in terms of technology. 
um, evidently there's there's um, there are new and very interesting technologies which are emerging. I can't I couldn't say that the techno that the position that we're at right now is um, absolutely revolutionary. But there are certainly a range of technologies on the horizon which are extremely promising. Um, and yes, it's, it's pushing towards more decentralized kind of manufacturing. Um, but on the other hand, we're also looking at very high tech solutions that um, could be shared across um, uh, at, a, at a city level by um, existing, by manufacturers. Um, so it's, so the way that we see it, we see three particular trends. We see a trend which is heading towards um, high tech automated uh, automation, artificial intelligence. Um, so Industry 4.0 or something like that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Internet of Things. We have another trend which is which is looking towards the, the met metabolic dimension of the story, of course, the circular economy yeah. um, uh, story. It's about how we use materials more wisely, more effectively. We generate less waste. Um, we get a better service out of the things that we produce mm -hmm. so that um, cities can be more efficient, efficient in their energy use, efficient in their, in their, their management of waste. And then you have the third dimension, which is the social dimension, mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is very much about how um, people um, can be providing services, how industry can be providing skills, um, how uh, the industrial process or the manufacturing process actually creates value added for, for the community. It could be anything from repairing things to, uh, to producing anything from furniture to housing to um, yeah, sorting glass or whatever you like. But that we could see as being a social service for society where manufacturing benefits society and it's certainly um, connected with the circular economy story. Yeah, th th there seems to be like, um, so imagine, I'm trying to, to put this into words, but the, um, so who will be the, the person that works in this new urban manufacturing? Because is it the low skilled person like in the past? Uh, is that the new urban industries that we're going to have? Is it the person that's super qualified coming from university and developing the how robots connect to each other? Um, are, is this urban industry the things that will automate so many things that finally urbanites will not work anymore and just <laughs> enjoy their lives? I mean, is, I, I see that you that you have this social and people perspective. But so if we take the, this case of Brussels, which is a very fragmented uh, population, so 20% uh, of structural unemployment and uh, a lot of uh, highly uh, educated people, either for the services or because of the universities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's say that there is new urban industry in Brussels, or I don't know how to call it. Is it new urban industry or Manuf urban manufacturing, uh, who will work there? I is there a role or could anyone work there? It's uh, industry um, has been seen as, a, as, as very useful f for a range of different uh, um, jobs and skills. On the one, the one extreme, from at the very social extreme, you have um, industry manufacturing offering low skilled people a step into work uh, uh, in a, a sector where you can easily climb up the ladder or you can become more specialized so that's a very that's an, a very important um, factor for for cities to have such um, work which is uh, very important for the city but allows people to then move into stable, uh, long-term, reliable jobs where they, they, um, that, are, that are suitable for people that are perhaps not um, so interested in the services economy. So that's, uh, that's at the very social end of the spectrum. Mm. At the other end of the spectrum, you have, um, you have uh, uh, businesses which 
um, which are certainly moving more into the into the into the high tech uh, world, where there's much more automation, and uh, that that is happening for for two reasons. One, because it's more cost effective, and you can create larger outputs. Uh, but it's also because um, a lot of businesses can't actually find the skilled labour to do it manually. Mm -hmm. So I have an example in, in Brussels, a, a, a tap company that, um, that it makes uh, very high-end taps. They can't find people that have the appropriate skills and these are not extremely uh, um, complex skills. They can't find the suitable people to employ Mm. To um, to to manage their machines, so they're forced to invest more money in machines that can automate uh, automate the process. Yeah. Yeah. It's not necessarily in their interest because machines they break down, mm. they cost a lot of money. Um, it can uh, become obsolete. They can, can become yeah. obsolete. Yeah. But it's simply a staffing question, and so uh, you're seeing you're seeing that machines are becoming. A more reliable uh, um, tool in the process. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And to be honest, manufacturing in Europe hasn't necessarily reduced uh, um, significantly over the last few decades. What has reduced certainly has been the personnel. Yeah. The outputs haven't necessarily reduced. So okay. that's it's an interest. It's an interesting point to be thinking about. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And and what's this? famous link with the circular economy because you there is two ways of seeing it I think there is the um, manufacturing as you say new processes of manufacturing can reduce the inputs can optimize the process and therefore also reduce the outputs you know make the ideal product let's say so urban manufacturing could help us into that perhaps but then there is also the the other end of the spectrum, which is, let's say, the waste side of the spectrum, which is remanufacturing or dismantling or perhaps recycling and all of that. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, in your mind, what what is more, is there something more relevant for the circular economy or is that the only two cases where urban manufacturing can engage with uh, circular economy? Are they others? Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say, in terms of the circular economy, it's 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 hard to it's hard to distinguish manufacturing from the circular economy because uh, at least urban manufacturing should be it should have uh, significant value for the city. If mm. it doesn't have significant value, then, then no, no. there is no point in 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 keeping it in the city. So, uh, an important uh, point to remember is that. If manufacturing is urban, it generally also requires some kind of protection, some kind of finance, some kind of um, some kind of public support, and so therefore the, f the mere fact that um, that uh, that that does exist should mean, as a basic criteria, that the manufacturing should be of be benefit to the city. So uh, yeah. we have um, a very controversial question uh, in, in Brussels. We have a, a very large um, uh, car manufacturer and they occupy an, an incredibly large site uh, at the south of Brussels, employ uh, some, a few thousand people. Um, but what that employment is, is essentially assembly. Now, the links between that manufacturer and the universities here in, in Brussels are extremely loose and we don't see a, a very particular um, benefit for Brussels apart from some small employment. Likewise, many of the employees, some 90% apparently, live outside of the region of Brussels yeah. and they travel into Brussels every single day. Yeah. So there's a fundamental question there of whether this very large actor is actually providing benefit for the city um, and also the, 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 the output which is being produced, a vehicle, is not necessarily being used in Brussels, used in Brussels or sold in Brussels. 
So therefore, we need to think whether that is of value. If this, if this manufacturer was extremely connected with the universities mm. and had R&D connected with the universities, if it was using uh, materials which were sourced locally or involved some kind of production chain locally, um, if it involved um, training and educating uh, um, personnel in Brussels, which then could then connect with spin-offs into other kind of industries, then you would say that that kind of industry is extremely valuable for the city and we should do everything we can. So that seems like a public industry, if you will. You know, some, because I, I get what you mean. And, and even before you started giving this example, I was, fig I was trying to, to think like, th does urban manufacturing is supposed to be private or public? Or is there a public version of it? Because what you seem to say is like, because when we see uh, the incinerator or you know, re recycling plants and things like that, sometimes it's just you know, public urban manufacturing. Uh, because it's useful to the city, because of the flows and all that. Mm -hmm. So, I in the case of, Au uh, I guess you mean Audi, right? The, but um, how do we, um, what, what's the control of the city uh, to that? D does it not give a, a permit or how do we, how does a city, what, what type of authority does the city have into the implementation of new uh, urban manufacturing activities? In the case of Audi, it's a, a relatively special uh, situation because yeah. it's a historical uh, development. It was uh, formerly, uh, I think, um, Volkswagen, and then before that, it was another yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. It's a special story, but um, but now we have a lot of friction between the the local municipality um, and the the factory, where the the mayor of that municipality feels that. Audi is not necessarily the best neighbor to have and therefore is um, is becoming, should we say, less welcoming. Um, yeah, we... we, we but cities he, pragmatically, he cannot kick them out, right? No, but he can certainly make it very uncomfortable for yeah, them to yeah. be there. And municipalities can make the relationship much stronger and mm. then, on the one hand, provide the, the kind of training conditions uh, and education conditions and links to local universities which are necessary for that business to, to evolve. Um, but on the other hand, can also um, create the conditions, the relationships with the neighbors, the infrastructure, which uh, this company depends on, much more accessible and, and, and attractive. So, yeah, the... the um, this is a this is a fundamental question for for public authorities is that they sh is that urban manufacturing should be seen as a, a service to society mm. because if it's not then what's the point in having it yeah that's um, not the right i mean it's too expensive to have an industry within a city there are actually, yeah there are much more effective ways of using land than yeah. having the industry in the city if it's not providing benefit so yeah it's it um, you, you there are certainly publicly funded and publicly owned forms of manufacturing uh, you could argue that the innocent incinerator is one you could argue that um, the wastewater treatment plant is yeah. another uh, you could argue that um, the waste uh, sorting um, plants <laughs> is another but it's it's um, at a certain point, um, private uh, businesses end up filling this kind of niche within the, ecolo the ecology of, of, uh, of manufacturing simply because they're much more competitive, much more risk-taking, mm. much more prepared to, um, to push uh, um, innovation. And so therefore, they're a much more appropriate partner to have. Um, but of course, you know that depends. If we look, if we look uh, back a uh, hundred years ago, a lot of companies were were nationalised, um, yeah, yeah. and and they worked extremely well. So yeah, I, whether it's public or private, I don't think it's so significant. I think it's a question of what is the benefit for society, and can how can we make that um, that relationship between. The, the making or the circular economy 
better, more embedded within that, that, that local context. And so I'm wondering because we talked about the territory slightly, right? I mean, y you said because of these new technologies, you can have one in your office or in your basement. Mm. Um, I, I'm always, you know, with this critical urban metabolism approach, like what does, an, uh, what does it going to change in the flows, right? Into mm. uh, the, the, sh the share or the bulk of all of the flows we need elsewhere. Perhaps it's going to relocalize some of our externalities. So at least our external footprint is going to, you know, become smaller. Uh, but h how do you see it? I mean, do, do you think that each office in Brussels should be producing as well? Or how do we really affect, you know, the, the bigger scheme of things with urban manufacturing? Mm. And, uh, and is it a thousand small or is it one big? Uh, do, do because this will impact very much the territory, right? I mean, do we have one zone of industrial, uh, let's say in Buda, do we just have new urban industries over there and that's it? Or is it everywhere spread around uh, Brussels and we don't need specific territorial conditions for that? We don't need the Zemus, we don't need nothing of that because it's different. Do, mm. do you have any thoughts on that? It's it's. The, the most appropriate space for mm, manufacturers will depend entirely on the, the type of manufacturing that, that, um, that they're focusing on. Some manufacturers need to be extremely close to, mm. to highways uh, or the canal because if not, then they become far less competitive. Others um, are much more uh, city focused and can be much closer to the city, uh, have much smaller um, orders uh, of materials, and therefore, for them, it's much more important to have uh, a public facade mm. and be connected with the with the local um, with the with the community. So, I think the most important thing for cities is not to say there should be one option or another. It's simply to provide um, as many options as possible, um, because. Uh, that's how we're going to allow the ecosystem to evolve. When cities, um, and we're seeing this particularly in, in, in London, for example, where um, uh, manufacturing has been focused much more on, on these uh, industrial areas, then a lot of makers have simply had to leave London because they just can't find the right space. Um, so yeah, it depends. It depends entirely on the business. Um, the the biggest the biggest challenge though is is to be ha be able to have availability and and a, and a wide variety of, of options for when a business is ready to be able to move that they can easily move either upscale or downscale, mm, yeah. and that happens in both directions. It's important that if a business has reached its its limit in one particular area, that it's easy enough for that business to move to another site nearby where, which means that it doesn't break its, um, its relationships with, uh, with other businesses that it depends on nearby, for instance. Um, and, s and so the options are extremely important. We've seen a lot of businesses in Brussels simply leaving Brussels, not because they don't want to be here. In fact, they really want to stay in Brussels. A lot of, a lot of businesses want to stay in Brussels because of the identity of Brussels, uh, but they just can't find the, the appropriate um, uh, space for that, to, for that to happen. Businesses um, can't really move more than once within, within a few decades. It's just extremely exp expensive. It creates an enormous uh, um, it's extremely, yeah. extremely damaging on, on yeah. their on their logistics. So, yeah, it, that's that's another issue why a lot of businesses are leaving town simply because they just can't find the right space. Should we push businesses to one one spot? Huh, it's it just depends entirely on what you see as as the most critical form of manufacturing. You might say that only that form of manufacturing that you could sti stick into a, into a shop front is, is critical. If you want to see the full range of manufacturing as being important, then you need to create um, space 
throughout the city within different kinds of environments, those close to freeways, those where you have an intensity of manufacturers, those which are close to, um, to a marketplace, which are generally close in, in, in the city. Mm. So that's the, that's the most uh, challenging issue, particularly when you have um, businesses that um, are under threat through land use change because a developer sees that it's much more useful in, in building housing or, or, or office space than to have a manufacturer. I think it's the closing remark and we might also be cut off, but uh, I'll just have to try to squeeze in again this uh, metabolic thing. I mean, do you think that, so we discussed with Stefan on the previous episode about how, you know, Brussels went from industry to tertiary and perhaps back to industry, but the metabolism itself kept growing and kept becoming bigger. Can uh, urban manufacturing also help us from an environmental point of view as well, you think? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is, I think, the missing link between mm -hmm. uh, the concept and the political dimension of the circular economy um, and putting that into action.